So why, though, would these chairs, with their fabric ripped up by the scooting around of the previous owners, why would these chairs be relevant to show you? Now, I, I understand the fabric is kind of a glaring error here, but if you are distracted by that, it is a sign that you are not yet a period furniture whisperer, as the prime premier French chair expert in the world told me that these were, quote, fabulous. So, anyway, with that humbly stated, the reason why we're using these as an example for the 1830s is that these are two of the most unusual and interesting French period chairs, circa 1835, signed by one of the top names of the period, Georges Alphonse Jacob de Malter, whose works, among other places, are, are found in the Louvre. And these specific chairs, even, well, a maple version of them, are found published in the key French text on the subject of 19th century art furniture by Denise Le Lebard. Now, the Jacob family firm, this lineage of master furniture makers, is so important that one-seventh of her tome of the entire dictionary is dedicated to them. And it begins in the 18th century with Georges Jacob, the grandfather of Alphonse here, who was known for his inventive chair designs and who worked for Marie Antoinette and Louis XVI. And then his sons continued to work through the tumultuous empire period and the previous revolution, and they left us with some of the most splendid creations in this empire style as they received numerous commissions from Napoleon. And then in 1825, their son, Georges Alphonse, took over command of the workshop. And then he continued working up until the 1860s. The firm was sold in 1847, and he passed away in 1868 and is now buried in Père Lachaise Cemetery along with the lead singer of The Doors, Jim Morrison, and the celebrated pianist, Frédéric Chopin. I do. Now, the direct order of business, as always, is to just preserve these works of art online as they are signed by one of the most renowned makers in French history. And the best way to learn, of course, is just to see as many good pieces as possible. Now, as usual, we'll be shedding some light on the decorative arts here to help people understand the difference between this essentially pre-industrial art form and everything else that is ambiguously called antiques. Uh, I want these two pieces to be part of an overarching clarification about early 19th century pieces and specifically this misunderstood period of the 1830s. Now, if you're new to this entire subject, and this already sounds like too specific of a pocket of art furniture history here for you, I promise that it does tie back into this subject as a whole to interest the seasoned enthusiast just as much as it's going to inform a beginner who may be here just to find some advice about that one purchase of furniture from the past that they're going to make in their entire lifetime. But nevertheless, uh, do grab your carrots because we are on the precipice of a very long rabbit hole here, a specific rabbit hole. And before we embark on this journey, at the, at the mouth of this tunnel, I would like for us to, to, to gnaw at this juicy tuber here provided by this outrageous uh, vignette, which just shows how well these pieces work in a modern setting. Because items like this aren't really about the past, you know? They're, they're about quality and beauty, and it's just that the past provided the correct socio-technological conditions for this unsurpassed beauty and quality to occur. And when we see them in an environment like this, we see what a wonderful interplay there is between these rich, historic, beautiful items and then this stark, white, sort of Swedish hospital-esque interior of, of today. So. With that being said, and very specifically now, it is pieces like this that account for why experts like Christopher Payne have written that this period of around 1830 in art furniture history deserves more attention. Now, why, why would a period that is responsible for anything this wonderful, why and how could this period have ever been overlooked by people in the know? Well, it's a good question, but simply put, the entire 19th century was originally overlooked because this is the century of industrialization, and so much of the furniture produced during the 19th century was thus the product of industry, which had nothing to do with the art of furniture of the 18th century. So once we saw just how much of the 19th century stuff out there was pale imitations, factory-made reinterpretations of earlier works of art, 
Well, the art authorities just said, okay, the 19th century is artistically corrupt, we, we amputate, and so they just threw out the dirty bathwater. But the problem was is that there was a baby in that bathwater. And someone said, oh my God, what, what about the early 19th century pieces that were made by master furniture makers, some of whom were, were alive during the 18th century? And th those pieces are tethered to that art paradigm. And, you know, so slowly, empire pieces up to the year 1815 started to receive some credit. And sure, the empire pieces are a little outrageous, they're a little stark, a little too robust, if you will, but, but you know, there's real quality, there's real art there. But then they decided that, you know, if we're going to come up with a cutoff date, instead of just saying 1815, we might as well make the cutoff the date after which industrialization truly became the rule. And so that's how 1830, 1840 kind of became the end of the traditional timeline in collectible decorative art furniture. When industrialization had truly changed the art of furniture from something that was a single artisanally produced piece by, by a master maker who had to devote his life to creating things that are so improbable, it shifted by the 1840s totally into factory production. And so the purists continued to ignore the 19th century totally, and they stayed looking only at the 18th century and before. And then the more open-minded collectors, well, you know, with so much compelling work having been made before 1830, well, it just so happened that the pieces, the really wonderful pieces of the 1830s, never really received the attention that they deserved. Now this omission is sort of being rectified now, but you can sort of see how it happened in the context of a real need to differentiate between the vast majority of 19th century factory work and these earlier, typically 18th century, traditionally 18th century works of art. And so there's the story of throwing the baby out with the bathwater, and here we are with two of the babies that were in this bathwater. So we could convincingly attribute these two chairs to the Jacob firm, as the same exact model, the unusual model here, appears published in this famous book about 19th century furniture. Now we would also think of the Jacob firm when just encountering a mahogany chair of this level of quality. But interestingly, these two chairs are actually signed, stamped underneath the front traverse of the chair. This is where we see this famous mark, the legendary mark in furniture history. And one of the perks of this late, unusual example of Jacob work is that these chairs are just too eccentric, they're too much from a categorically undervalued period to have been faked. And so with these, it is more likely than usual that the stamps are authentic. And now we say that these were made by Georges Alphonse Jacob de Malter because stylistically they date to the time when he was at the head of the workshop. Although it is highly unlikely that he personally worked on these chairs or very many of the pieces made at his workshop, seeing as, you know, this famous company of his, of his family, was furnishing all the courts and personalities of Europe. He rather oversaw teams of master furniture makers and oversaw the designs. And I hate to burst anyone's bubble, but talking about the Jacob firm is not quite the same story as the lone romantic master furniture maker, you know, chiseling things like this out by his lonesome somewhere in the countryside. The Jacob firm, although highly artful, highly memorable, it was a major business. So the style here is really to the tune of the 1830s as kind of an exuberant final chapter in the evolution of French neoclassicism. Now this is an aesthetic movement that began in the 1750s, right around 1750, sparked by the resurgence and in interest in ancient classical art in rectilinear order, and also sparked by the excavations of Pompeii. Now this movement was also kind of an artistic reaction to the excesses that the curvilinear Rococo style had kind of devolved into at the time. But we first see this neoclassical movement appearing as elements of decor applied to fundamentally Rococo pieces, like a little Greek key border here and there. And then by the 1760s, the Greek style or the transitional style of half Rococo, half neoclassical in terms of design was in full swing. By the 1780s, the fully neoclassical but lighthearted Louis XVI style had emerged. And then by the year 1800, we ended up with the stark, robust neoclassicism of the Napoleonic Empire, which then was sort of tempered, redirected, and developed during the years of the restoration of the Bourbon monarchy from 1815 to 1830. And then what's interesting here 
in 1835, the final hurrah of French neoclassicism is that we end up with an exaggeration, an exuberant culmination of all the different phases of neoclassicism that ends up just as curvy here as the Rococo style to which it was originally a correction, a reaction. We've come full circle. How we are often guilty of that which we criticize in others. But anyway, as we delve into the elements specifically of the neoclassicism that we see on these chairs, right away we're going to notice this gondola back that emerges out of the Napoleonic Empire, which was rigid, and then we see in the Restoration the backs take on this comfortable curve. And here we see the scrolls that are reminiscent of the work of Georges Alphonse's grandfather, Georges Jacob, you know, 50, 60 years earlier. Then we're going to see that the saber legs of the empire period have been retained, but the feet here have been exaggerated. Instead of just being a little paw at the bottom of a squared and tapered leg, we have the fully muscled leg of a lion here. And then we see the scrolls emblematic of the restoration period, which here terminate in an unusually fine rosace, and they rest on this little bed of water plants that evoke the classical tropics. And we see that these pieces, this 1835 style, did not omit a little nod to the glorious inlay work of the neoclassical, short-lived Charles X style of the 1820s, with these discrete fillets of Hollywood inlaid into the front of the seat. And now one final thing to note here is that both of these chairs are chassis chairs, they fauteuil à chassis. It just means that the cushions can be removed. And this is perhaps a more complicated design, but in any case, this type of design is associated with a tier of chair that would have been owned by people who could afford to reupholster them more frequently. And so if you have any comments about that, in any case, I can attest to how these chassis chairs, ones with removable cushions, it's associated with chairs of a higher unusual quality. So if you're still with me down this rabbit hole, the next thing these chairs help us do is form a curator's approach to the Louis Philippe period. Because there's a huge distinction between early Louis Philippe of this artistic variety made by some of the most renowned master furniture makers of the 19th century who were still rooted in the traditions of the 18th century, huge difference between pieces like this, rare pieces like this, and everyday Louis Philippe. So much Louis Philippe was of course the result of industry. Furniture made under a paradigm which was nothing like this artisanally made single one at a time type production, but rather furniture that was made in factories in a series which was adapted to the practical needs and budgets of a much larger swath of the population and which really has little to do with these works of decorative art. Now one text that really honors the decorative arts of the Louis Philippe period is A Golden Age of Decorative Arts, 1818 to 1848, with the section written in French on the furniture of the July monarchy by Colombe Verlet, daughter of Pierre Verlet, anyway, the premier family of scholars on this subject. Well, she writes of a literary character at the time, Mr. Prudhomme, who is the symbol of the new sensible middle class. Prudhomme coming from sensible man, the prudent man, the normal man. And anyway, she writes of his boring and practical interiors with military precision, and we still encounter today a host of pieces which would have been made for this type of person. Nice looking, practical, but beyond the charm, they were very affordable pieces compared to what we're used to collecting. So a curator would understand this, look through all of those pieces, and understand that Mr. Prudhomme's pieces, while kind of nice, were not really the taste of society. Now, paradoxically, Verlet also mentions the character of Madame de Girardin, who was actually a real person and who married one of the most successful French publishers of the day. She was wealthy and influential and Balzac would be at her house, Victor Hugo would be at her house, and anyway, the smallest, most innocuous sofa or light fixture would cost the education of a child. And so even if much Louis Philippe that we'll encounter is industrial, is every day, there was still an amazing art furniture production going on at the time. And people like Girardin were paying fortunes for the works of the last furniture makers, for the last artists. And now today, as aspiring informal curators, people who select things intelligently, we can't make our decisions based on dates or based on the names of a style, but rather based on the paradigm under which the object was made. So is the piece 
a work of art or is the piece a piece of industry? And if the piece is a piece of industry, we really shouldn't be paying the price of a tuition of a child for it, especially if we've watched this video. And really to make matters worse in terms of looking at the decorative art of this period, the prime quote of the Louis Philippe period, misquote, which is now a slogan, is go get rich, enrichissez-vous. And that just sort of shows how, you know, this is remembered as a time where money mattered, not art. Now, of course, this quote of enrichissez-vous is, is actually taken out of context when Prime Minister François Guizot was making an overarching political argument that if you would like to participate in the politics of the country, first go enlighten yourself, go enrich yourself, improve the moral and material conditions of our France, and then come into the political world. But nevertheless, the slogan now of Go Get Rich just shows us how our collective memory sees the Louis Philippe period more as a time of industry. However, it is pretty clear that this period did leave us with some wonderful works of decorative art. Not only these publication quality chairs, but some real furniture masterpieces like this mechanical desk made for the 1834 Paris exhibition by a maker who furnished King Louis Philippe. Now that desk is like these chairs in style, also being an exuberant culmination of all of the chapters of French neoclassicism. But on the desk, we see the massive, uniquely Louis Philippe umbrella legs, named as such, of course, for you know, their tapered form, but also as a wink to the king who was known to walk around Paris with his umbrella. You know, the funny thing about the Louis Philippe period not being remembered for the excellence of its decorative art is that Louis Philippe himself was nuts for decorative art. I mean, when he was in exile, there was nothing for him to do but shop and decorate palaces. And then when he does come to power in 1830, he immediately refurnishes the Palais Royal. He did the same with the Chateau de Neuilly. And then he had his country place, the Chateau du. And with his architect, Fontaine, and his immense personal fortune, he really demonstrated an affinity for interior decor. And throughout his reign, we see that he restored all of the royal chateaux, Compiègne, Fontainebleau, Trianon, he had his personal places of Amboise, La Ferté Vidame, and Rondon. And he was also famous for buying all sorts of things at the precursors to the world's fairs, these Expositions des Produits de l'Industrie Française. He even restored the Chateau de Pau in southwestern France and redecorated it, where he never actually went. So anyway, even if we have to understand that there is a whole body of sort of uncollectible industrial pieces from the time, there are some real gems to look out for during the time of Louis Philippe. And now finally, we do see chairs of this variety signed by the same maker, many of them in fact, conserved in the French Ministry of Culture's National Furniture Reserve, Mobilier National. And we see one chair in particular, which appears to have conserved its original blue fabric, which was delivered by Georges Alphonse Jacob des Malteurs to the Duke of Orleans, to King Louis Philippe's son himself, for his apartments in the Tuileries Palace. And now if this good furniture maker did not necessarily make that chair himself, or these for that matter, thanks to no doubt a team of masters that worked for him, I think we can safely guess that perhaps Georges Alphonse would have personally delivered that chair to the son of the king of all people. Why not? Well, everybody, there you have it. The last of the master furniture makers cutting off here in 1835, the last bit of French neoclassicism as post-1835 during this time period, even for art quality pieces, the Louis Philippe style is no longer a logical evolution, but rather a more confusing eclecticism. And we see that what the history of art gains from 1835 to 45, in matter of connoisseurship and revivals of previous styles, it seems to lose in pure creativity, as if the artists of the decade after these were made were just sort of perched looking backwards with a little bit of vertigo, unable to find or found a style unique to their own time. And so, with all that said, I really think that for 19th century pieces, for work in general, the first order of approach should just be to determine whether or not it's a work of art, and then to worry about dates and categorization. And so, if you've liked this video, please subscribe to the channel, as it would greatly help in the endeavor of raising awareness about the decorative arts, so that people don't throw the babies out with the bathwater, and also in just creating a period furniture library of the most compelling pieces that I encounter. Thank you.